If there's one thing that I've seen people claiming infinite wisdom in without really offering anything to honestly back it up, I'd have to say that for movie discussion, it really is Jurassic Park. I can't tell you how many times I've come across articles, watched speculation videos, or just heard something come out of someone's mouth during a conversation on the series that seriously made me question what the hell I was witnessing. It's gotten to the point that, from the perspective of someone like me, you just have to watch the misinformation get put out on the internet and wait a few moments for the fans to flock their way and rightfully complain about the absurdity of most of these publications. Nevertheless. The clickbait continues to dribble to the masses from the mouths of those who are honestly unfamiliar with the work. And I've seen no weirder claim than that of Dr. Michael Crichton's original novel being apparently read by certain so-called pundits to being something that was bastardized by Colin Trevorrow's Jurassic World. Now, if you've actually read the original novel and its sequel, The Lost World, by the way, you should be able to approach this argument with all of the information you need to figure out if this statement is true or false. If you haven't done that or just want to know the answer, then buckle up because I'm about to dive in and go to work. I've heard the odd person complain that much of what happens in Jurassic World would be disliked or even detestable to Michael Crichton, for the lack of any of the fourth film's events or commentary being present in his original works. To put it bluntly, the individuals claiming such a notion are outright lying to you. They may not know what they're talking about, but if that was seriously the case, one questions why they'd even attempt to throw their hats in the ring of this conversation. It's weird. Honestly, I can't believe I'm even having this discussion. But to save us all time and just get into why this statement is false, I think it's best if we just go ahead and begin. One of the things that people immediately purport to be unfaithful to Crichton's work is the genetic alteration of their cloned animals, specifically the existence of the Indominus Rex. Its ability to change its thermal signature, and specifically camouflage, are attributes that pseudo-experts will claim to be absent in anything with the author's name attached to it. This is one of the reasons that I seriously question the ability of these individuals to be objective in what they're saying, because that is absolutely not true. In fact, the camouflaging ability of the Indominus Rex is lifted directly from two events that take place in both novels, Jurassic Park and The Lost World. The first time was the genetic alteration of a wild juvenile raptor who was changing colors like a chameleon in the park, and the second was with two carnotaurs on Isla Sorna who used the ability to hunt their prey. Henry Wu even engages in a lengthy debate with John Hammond in the novel on whether or not they should alter their dinosaurs to better suit the tourist's needs. Wu offered newer versions of the animals that could be more docile and slow, which could potentially meet the audience expectations of those who imagined them as such in their youth. This scene was actually adapted and shown in Jurassic World, with Simon Mizrani taking the place of Hammond, which leaves the lingering question in my mind as to why anyone would even entertain the idea that Crichton would dislike it. If anything, Jurassic World is an amalgamation of not only the author's two dinosaur works, but also of the 1973 movie he wrote and directed, Westworld. In this story, Crichton shows us the dangers of an elaborate theme park with lifelike androids that eventually malfunction and begin to kill the guests. Jurassic Park was kind of inspired by this idea to some degree, but that first book and film didn't involve a functioning theme park in the way that Westworld and Jurassic World did, linking more of the author's work than just the source material itself. But there still remains the claim that Jurassic World included a self-referential commentary that didn't exist in Crichton's books. Some would argue that the fourth movie shouldn't have put itself in the position to explore such thoughts because this thinking was never addressed by the source material itself. Literally. The first thing you read by Ian Malcolm in The Lost World, I mean seriously, the first thing written by Crichton for his character in the book is the quote, Sequale are inherently unpredictable. His lead character straight up breaks the fourth wall to talk about this as soon as you open the book. In fact, he routinely addresses the fact that he died in the first novel and how it's unbelievable for people to understand that he's back in this new installment, telling his critics that he's sorry to cut their celebration short, but he was actually only slightly dead. The entire first novel, and to some degree even the second, dives into the chaotician's objection to what many self-proclaimed experts believe to be true. He'll often go off in tangents on how stupid it is for groups of people to assume they have complete control, and every time their position is challenged, Malcolm proves them wrong by beating them up with their own argument. Jurassic Park has always been very critical of this kind of thinking, which makes it hilarious for anyone who knows the source material to see unfound criticisms to the commentary in the fourth film. Calling the blockbuster self-awareness 
less hypocritical because of its exploration of the larger scaled chaos that ensues from the company's overindulgence, is in itself hypocritical for anyone who's read the books or even seen the first movie. I mean, you packaged it, you patented it, you slapped it on a plastic lunchbox, and now you're selling it. You want to sell it. Another thing people forget about Michael Crichton was his inability to tell the story he originally wanted to write. During his time writing what would become one of the biggest franchises of all time, Michael Crichton faced a pretty relentless uphill battle with his stubborn publishers. Crichton envisioned a dinosaur theme park that relied heavily on the wonder and awe of children. Jurassic Park was going to be a story told through the eyes of a child to illustrate the magnitude of such an immaculate recreation. Crichton was fascinated with how children from all around the world idolized dinosaurs and wanted to capture this fascination in his soon-to-be novel. Unfortunately, every time he turned in drafts of his book, everyone told him it was going to be a solid no. It got to the point where Crichton eventually decided to retool the tone of his story and make it a dark thriller that contained several gruesome depictions of dinosaur attacks that involved blood and guts getting torn out and thrown all over the place. Once he did this, the publishers decided to go ahead and put his work on store shelves. Steven Spielberg, a close friend of Michael, happened to catch wind of the project early on and pretty much snagged his position to direct the adaptation early before any of the talks of Tim Burton, Joe Dante, or James Cameron were discussed. As such, Spielberg kind of did Crichton a solid by turning the techno horror story into a techno thriller that children the world over would idolize and flock to, the most current iteration of which happens to be Trevorrow's Jurassic World. This time, the film embraced the heritage of Jurassic Park wholeheartedly, with its introduction and subsequent employment of the new character, Grey, who is not only fascinated with dinosaurs in a way similar to Timmy from the first movie, but also makes it a point to stop and take in the sights of such an incredible place existing in his world. It's through his eyes, the eyes of an actual child, that Jurassic Park was originally envisioned for by Crichton himself. From all of this conjecture, I'm sure it's somewhat easy to understand that Jurassic World is in fact filled with ideas and sentiments that originally originated in the mind of Michael Crichton, and as such really should be taken into consideration whenever someone tries to make an argument for why he would dislike the film. I'd go as far to say that Jurassic World is actually the film that best represents Crichton's vision for the Jurassic stories he published back in the 90s. As far as those who believe it to be unrepresentative of the author, I'd like to quote his work itself. They don't have intelligence. They have what I call thin intelligence. They see the immediate situation. They think narrowly and call it being focused. They don't see the surround. They don't see the consequences. Michael Crichton, Jurassic Park. However, even with me citing all these sources and showing you all their placement within the newest film, I'm sure some will still conveniently ignore the facts. Some odd complaint is bound to drool its way into some article somewhere and attempt to gain your attention for a short period of time in order to frame a narrative. Probably something to do with Fallen Kingdom's volcano, to be honest. Which, by the way, is not only in the book, but also addressed in the second movie. Remember that line of him and running everything off of geothermal power, which was never in need of any replenishing? If you don't, then you'll surely remember that Nick Van Owen used the power to his advantage and getting off of Isla Sorna, right? I mean, Nublar itself featured the volcano on the brochure that can be seen in the first movie. Its corresponding peak is even shown in the control room. And it's shown again and even named in the 2011 release Jurassic Park The Game. So yeah, wrong again. With all of that being said, I want to get your thoughts back on all of this information. Do you guys wish for the new films to be even more faithful to Crichton's two books, or are you more interested in having them take more liberties with the source material? Let me know if you've read the novels and what you think in the comments down below. Now, before I go, I'd like to thank my game wardens, like Jared Meza, as well as all of my engine executives. I'd also like to thank my park workers and engine hunters as well, Ernest Hegman and DinoBro007. It seriously means the world that you've chosen to support the channel this way, and I can't I can't believe how awesome it is to have all of you guys help me build this thing up to become bigger and better every day. Now, I'd like to thank all of you for watching this video, and hope that you all enjoyed today's content. If you feel like I deserve it, I'd appreciate the like and hope that you'll consider subscribing and hitting the bell if you're interested in hearing from me again. I'll see you on the next video guys, and as always, take it easy.